Uh, first of all, I want to welcome everybody here, and um, we're just very, very pleased with the, with the turnout. But I think I'd be a little remiss if I didn't go back in history just a little bit. You know, we on the Delmarva Peninsula have a fairly short history as far as unlocking it. If you go back just a few years, I can well remember uh, going across the ferry to Western Maryland. I can remember taking a ferry from Cape Charles to Virginia uh, mainland. And I can remember when the DuPont family took Route 1 and it became DuPont Highway and made a single lane but widened road out of it. All those things were in the past. The only thing that came down here of consequence was the railroad. That was through the northern part of uh, Delaware. It uh, had that little neck up there around Wilmington. And there was no really other type of traffic other than railroad. The railroad took our products. It took our agricultural products, our potatoes, our fresh fruits, vegetables, oysters, clams, and in some instances, a uh, little wildfowl. <laughs> but then things began to change a little bit. And I'll never forget when um, the governor of Maryland decided to build the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. Uh, that was in the 50s. And then it really began to change when they put the Bay Bridge tunnel in. Now up until that time, our culture had remained basically the same. Our livelihoods had been basically the same, agricultural, <laughs> fishing. And we kind of had a lock on our culture, on our value systems. With those two things, we began to have more and more traffic. We began to see changes in our way of earning a living. We saw greater tourism in Ocean City. But in looking back at the history of Bobadell, which was created in 1917 by a bunch of northerners, some of whom were all financials involved with General Motors to be. And then in seeing 1937, at the height of the Depression, a letter that Jay Bunning got me from Josh's files asking him to sell Bobadell. So up until that point in time, there had been very little difference. We had our hunting clubs. We had no way to get over to Assateague Island. Uh, old Jackpot Pie, I remember well, had an old ferry boat that we go down 611 and get on. And then you would have a buggy, a beach buggy. And a few people would go over there with their outboard motors. But mostly, it was to the hunting lodges, to the green runs, the valentines, the uh, high winds. Now, change is a wonderful thing, but change also changes history. History. Most history can't be written and then not be written accurately for 100 years, 50 or 100 years. You have to see what happens and why it happened. Then you get a different scholarly view on what happened, why it happened. Tonight, we are the most fortunate people living to have a hand in history that has not changed. The people that are most fortunate are the people from the Ward Foundation, the people from the NAB Center, and you people that are out here willing to share your stories. Because you're looking at dramatic change that occurred. Greater change for us than the Bay Bridge, greater change for us than the Chesapeake Bay Tunnel Bridge. The Enabling Act that took Assateague Island out of the private hands and made it a national park. Simultaneous legislation occurred with the Maryland State Park. That was a wall that came down. It stopped change. It was over. It was finished. So the past, which can be brought forth here tonight, it's not that long ago. The past memories are not that long ago. 
we're in a very unique situation. I've never seen such a greater opportunity to historically get something correct. Thank God for the NAB Center. Thank God for the Ward Foundation because they're documenting change. They have people here tonight that can carry that transformation with no change to accurately write a history about these hunting clubs on acetate. So it is a unique opportunity. And I want to say uh, right now that the great protector of our culture, of our heritage, is the NAB Center. And I can't say enough about the director of that NAB Center. He's on fire, he's a researcher, he's an accurate researcher, and he is absolutely a number 10 when we get into that area. And the Ward Foundation, obviously, uh, is in line with that. So at this time, I want to introduce our our folks here, we got Laura Bottinelli from the uh, Ward Foundation. Laura. We got Christine Sullivan, her assistant, back there. We have Dr. Ray Thompson, and we have his hardworking assistant, Stephanie Gordy. Now, as we proceed tonight, what you're going to find out is that you're going to have memories that are going to be reawakened. I've asked them to make contact with you people. So you've got to see Stephanie, or you've got to see Kristen Sullivan. Give them their phone numbers so they can get back to you, find any pictures that you haven't brought tonight, but more importantly, share your experiences with them. This is going to go in the lockbox. This is going to be preserved forever and ever. I always like to use as an example my grandson Matt and my grandson Mike. They had an experience at Bobadell. I'm a great grandfather now. Two boys, one for Matt, one for Mike. They've had no experience. The experience they can get is the experience of being able to see history, be able to feel it, be able to ask their fathers questions. Pretty soon, their fathers will be old like me. So without the NAB Center, without this documentation, history would be lost. So this is truly a unique thing. It's a great thing for us, and it's a great thing for the researchers and historians. It's a win-win-win. Doctor, I'll turn it over to you. I'd like to thank each of you for coming out tonight to see and to hear what I think is going to be a very interesting and very evocative presentation. I'd like also to thank Mr. Buddy Jenkins for making this evening possible and for Headmaster Tull for making available this room for our uh, being here tonight. For those of you who do not know about the NAB Research Center for Delmarva History and Culture at SU, I would ask you to come visit us at some time uh, because we are one of Delmarva's real hidden treasures. We hold an extensive repository of documents and artifacts and are open not only uh, to academic classes of all levels, but also to anyone who wishes to come to, to discover more about the history and culture of Delmarva or about their own family origins. We're here to help you in any way we can to bring a light uh, for you to the wonderful heritage of the Eastern Shore. Thank you again for spending an evening with us as we discover a or. Uh, refresh our memories of a time when freedom seemed as endless as the marsh. Our look at shanty boats and gunning clubs of the seaside will hopefully intrigue each of you to discover more about this subject. Our intention tonight is to share with you vintage photographs and interviews of people who were a part of the shanty boat and gunning club tradition. We'll allow plenty of time at the end of the presentation for each of you to share your thoughts and experiences of shanty boats and gunning clubs uh, with the rest of us. A document scanner and document projector are available for those of you who have brought photos or memorabilia to share. We want this to be your presentation. We welcome your joining in the discussion. I'll introduce each section of the presentation and then allow you to absorb the images and words as they appear on the screen. Charles Overholt, the first Fulbright Scholar from West Salisbury University who helped produce this exhibit and who is himself a waterman who knows the Gunning Club Vista intimately will assist with the narrative. 
Since there are many quotes on the screen, I've asked Charles to read the quotes to you so you can hear them as the photographs are flashed on the screen. I'd like to say just a few words about how the exhibit came to fruition. I had never heard of a shanty boat until Pat Russell came to the NAB Research Center proposing that we at NAB host a shanty boat and gunning clubs exhibit. On, I, she told me of her having been on a boat trip down the coastal bays of Middlemore Ditch on Aztec Island to see the shanty boat Bobadell. She told me that on the way down the bay, she was struck by the shallow water, which was seldom more than four feet deep, except in the main channel, and by the large expanse of marsh grass. While on board, she was regaled with stories of the Bobadell and other barrier island shanty boats, their guides and owners, and great waterfowl hunting stories were also told. She was enthralled and wished to know more. A series of grant awards from the Maryland Historical Trust and the Delmarva Folklife Project allowed Pat to record the stories about shanty boats and to collect photographs and interviews, which she later placed at the NAB Center for Future Researchers to mine. Incidentally, the Ward Museum has just mounted a, a significant exhibit on this very subject, so you'll want to take advantage of going to the Ward Museum to see it. But on to the exhibit itself. Uh, it was 10 years before the exhibit depicting the stories came to fruition at the NAB Center. It's my hope that each of you this evening will enjoy this snapshot of the seaside shanty boat and waterfowling tradition. The exhibit consists of images of shanty boats and gunning clubs, quotes from interviews with individuals whose lives were bound up in the traditions of gunning clubs and shanty boats. Each of those photos and quotes gives us a glimpse into the changes in the landscape and the lives of people over the past century. And through their stories and photographs, an opportunity to preserve the life they knew before it slips beneath the surface and completely disappears. On a cold, misty morning in December 1998, a weather-worn green and white door was locked for the final time. The Babadell Gunning Club, in operation for 81 years, was officially closed and handed over to the United States government. In an ironic twist of fate, the sealed doorway, which had once ushered hundreds of hunters into gunning excursions on the marshes, now symbolized the club's very inaccessibility. It divided memories from reality and the past from the future. Bobadell and the many clubs like it on the barrier islands trace an evolution in both the form and function of the gunning club from the humble shanty boat of J.W. Quillen and Miles Hancock to the sprawling land-based complex at Green Run. The significance of the shanty boats to waterfowl hunting has been largely overlooked. This is the story of those clubs and their decline using the words, photographs, and memories of those who love them. So now we set the stage. Uh, in setting the stage, we look first at the landscape, uh, the seaside of Worcester County, as you see in this map. Uh, with its shanty boats, lodges, and clubhouses located on the bay side of Assateague Island. There, uh, large concentrations of ducks, swans, and geese are attracted to the marshes and watery area as they migrate through the Atlantic Flyway. The sky sometimes seen black, nearly with birds. Next, we see a map with locations of seaside shanty boats and gunning clubs. Gunning shanty boats were popular in the Mid-Atlantic region from the 1880s to the turn of the 20th century. Every marsh was dotted with little houseboats. Every waterfowler worth the name had his houseboat tucked up in some creek or thoroughfare. He holed up in the ducking area for days at a time. Zach Taylor, Successful Waterfowling, page 121. Next, we look at the shanty boat. The shanty boat, or ark, was a houseboat or a floating shanty which had been widely used on the eastern shore of Maryland for over 100 years. They differed from other craft in that they had neither sail nor engine. They needed to be towed or for short distances could be poled or drifted on the tide. Since many were homemade, their form depended upon available materials and the skill and preferences of the builders. Typically, the gunning shanty was made up of two shanty boats, each approximately 15 feet by 30 feet. The shanty boat which housed the guide and cook contained the galley and dining room. Each shanty boat had rooms with bunk beds. 
The interior walls and ceilings were often narrow beaded tongue and groove boards. The exterior was usually constructed of cedar and yellow pine and white oak. A wooden plank connected the two shanties. The Nanticoke River shanty boat pictured in these illustrations was a smaller, lighter version of the seaside shanty boat. These drawings show some of the typical features that appeared in all shanty boats. A wood stove for cooking and heat and built-in bunks on the side. You sat on the bunks and put boards together for a table to eat. It was a rough life, William Crawford Savage. Most of them were pretty well laid out in the same way. The bow of the boat was usually built like a scow. There was a flat bottom barge. Most had a flat roof. Some of them may have had a bit of a caravel, a little tiny bit of roundness so the water could get off of it. Rolling fish pow. Some of them had an outside privy on the very stern where your waist is simply dropped down into the water. And they would maybe have a storage room. You heated with wood or coal. Once you opened the doors, we went immediately into a larger room with a small room off to one side of, side of it for the kitchen cook. And the dining room and the kitchen was all on one room. And then you had a little hallway on each side and you had tiny little bedrooms. Rolling fish pal. Here we see the fully equipped shanty boats together. Next, we look at who was on the shanty boat, the guide, the hunter, and the cook. Locals often hired to work on the shanty boats, uh, and they acted as guides during the hunting season. Individuals were needed to guide, carve decoys, pick feathers, cook, clean and do laundry, build boats, provide transportation to and from blinds, and maintain and manage the lodges and clubs. The guide was the most important person on the shanty boat or in the gunning club. He was considered indispensable to a hunter's success, pleasure, and peace. In addition to his knowledge of ducks, he was also skilled in diplomacy. The guide would turn around to the people in the bind and say, well, they're close enough now, you can get up and shoot. And then when they shot them, if they killed anything, if they didn't, the guide would see that they did. William Crawford Savage. A typical hunter was a northern sportsman, usually from Boston, New York, or Philadelphia, who had, been the mean, who had the means and pleasure uh, and time to engage in waterfowling for recreation. Waterfowling was, and still can be, very expensive. Only the wealthy could afford the expense and time it took to travel to the best hunting area. It was just great to go hunting. It didn't make any difference whether you really killed anything. The fun was just being there and thinking you might. Dr. Francis J. Townsend, Jr. A good cook and good hot food was a necessity. Cooks, both African American and white, were usually male. They weren't the best cooks in the world. One time we said, why are all these hotcakes always so cold when we have them? The cook said, well, you fellows don't get up till 6, and I cook them at 3. <laughs> Dr. Francis J. Townsend, Jr. Here again, we see the cook, guide, and hunter on the shanty boat. All guides and employees are housed in rooms separately. Hence, their early morning preparation to go to the blinds will not disturb the guests until breakfast call is made. Green Run Lodge brochure, 1946. Next, we look at advertising. How did people find out about the gunning clubs and the shanty boats? Shanty boat owners were quite adept at marketing their shanty boats and guiding services to sportsmen in newspapers and hunting journals using engaging photographs, correspondence, and also by word of mouth. Forest and Stream, founded in 1873 and published in New York City, was a weekly newspaper for sportsmen. J.W. Quillen marked himself as the guide that gets the game and brought his first shanty boat and bought his first shanty boat in 1904. This letter and envelope from a Washington, D.C. hunter to J.W. Quillen, a local guide, is postmarked 1906, when Ocean City was yet a quaint village of Victorian-style homes and hotels with a population of less than 500. Next, we look at getting there. 
Once arrangements had been made for the hunt, the next important thing was how to get to the eastern shore. A combination of steamboat and railroad brought most of the earliest hunters to the seaside, while later airplanes provided transportation. The locality is easily reached by rail from Wilmington to Harrington Station, and thence by either of two railroads via Georgetown or Salisbury to Berlin. From Berlin, there is rail communication in summer to Ocean City, a delightful resort on the beach six miles distant. But cars are not run in winter except for the special accommodations of chance shooting parties, whom the railway officials are always ready to favor. The hotel at Ocean City accommodates some 400 guests. The railroad was only open last year, but now that access is made easy, Ocean City will hereafter be more largely patronized than ever, and a second hotel is being built in anticipation of increasing numbers. Forest and Stream, November 23rd, 1876. Once at the seaside, one had to determine whether to lodge on the shanty boat or to stay in Ocean City with members of one's family who might have come along for the vacation. Among the hotels in Ocean City at the time were the Atlantic Hotel and the Plymouth Hotel. Lots of people come to the hotel that didn't take the reservation with the club, these hunting clubs. We had a lot of guides who take them out from the town here. You see, just, just five houseboats. At times, they were all filled with hunters. Miles Hancock. There were, however, many other hotels in Ocean City where guests could be accommodated, as this listing shows. By 1918, Many of the guides used their shanty boats as accommodations for the sportsmen who did not make reservations at a club or nearby hotel. With the shanty boat, hunters could stay out in the marshes for several days or even a week at a time. It was a way of life with us. We were raised in the mud and marshes around here, you know, Tom Reed. You hunted wherever you wanted to. If you found a good place to hunt, then you just pulled up this floating shanty, and that was your headquarters. Until you found a different spot, or the ducks and geese moved to some other place, and you moved with them. William Crawford Savage. Here again, we see the guide and hunters. One of the most recognizable guides was Miles Hancock. Ducks were my living. Understand, there were no game laws then. The country was young and hungry. We filled the need. Miles Hancock. When I was started, you shot him any way you could. No law against it. Sometime you shoot till you think your boat will sink. Tom Reed. We killed a lot of ducks. We killed 1,100 ducks and five geese. 1,020 ducks and five geese in the month of November alone. William Falwell Jester. I remember going with my dad. He'd have one of the guides take me out, and I never recall ever shooting anything. Well, maybe one or two ducks, but I was just six or seven years old. The fun was being in a shanty and going out with the guides. We'd started hunting at an early age, and we always had fun. It was just fun. Roland Earl Fish Pal. That was one of the first times I went hunting. The gentleman who took me had most all the equipment, and so all I had was my old squirrel gun. I shot the first duck over the water. The older guys were always telling me, oh, you got that one, but you never knew whether you did or not. They were all shooting at the same time. George A. Purnell. I was probably about 10 or so when I first went to high winds. I couldn't see over the blind. So they would turn an old wooden box upside down in the blind so I could stand up and see over to shoot. That really hooked me, George A. Purnell. My best shot was the day I bagged 52 redheads with five shots, Miles Hancock. <laughs> Next, we'll look at live decoys. 
Tame ducks and geese were used as decoys, often in combination with wooden decoys. When the live birds were anchored along a lot of wooden stools, the decoy's actions mimicked the actions of wild ducks or geese feeding or playing in the water. They did their work well. Sighting wild ducks or geese, the energetic honks or quacks of the live decoys generally succeeded in drawing the birds within gunshot range. They'd have to catch their live decoys and put them in coops and put the coops on the boat, carry them out to the duck line. They'd shoot, kill the fowl. They'd have to load them back up on the boat and they'd haul and carry them in, put them back in the pen. Turner P. Cropper. If you didn't have live geese, you probably didn't get the geese to come to you. See, they would put out so many wooden decoys and then the live decoys. They clipped the wings on the geese so that they wouldn't fly. Your live ones, you got the honking. Dorothy P. Hudson. How complacent the live decoys seemed as they triumphantly surveyed the havoc they had helped create. And with what a self-satisfied air they settled down to business again and awaited the coming of the next reinforcement. The keen observer could almost fancy he detected mutual congratulations among the flock and saw, as in the historical olden time, the old gray goose a smiling at the gander. Forest and Stream, November 1876. When we saw the duck off there flying, saw our decoys, we would take this drake in our hands and we'd throw him right up. And he would fly over the decoys and the little ducks would quack at him. He would light down in the water, swim ashore. Well, the trick to get him back was we had a little cork, not no bigger than your thumb, and we'd tie it to a little piece of fine fishing twine and tied it onto the duck's leg. We threw him out, that would unwind, and when he got in the water, we got the little cork and pulled it to us. Wasn't no trick to it at all. And where the little ducks were, we used him, and when he settled, they'd quack, and it would bring that other duck in. William Falwell Jester. <coughs> Next, we look at the hunter's best friend. Dogs were very important. Dogs were very important, and according to one hunter, it was part of an ego trip to have a better dog. There were many, there was, there were many discussions as to whether the lab or the Chesapeake Bay Retriever was better suited for the cold, raw, wet days that were ideal for duck hunting. Actually, we found that the Labradors could not hold up under the severe winter conditions as well as the Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. They were more mannered, they were more skilled, but the Chesapeake Bay Retriever held up better in cold weather. Charles R. Buddy Jenkins. A little knowledge of dogs is desirable at times, when a spaniel can be employed to retrieve birds that fall into the water out of reach. Forest and Stream, November 1876. Funny about them dogs. If you shot and missed, they'd jump overboard and check the decoys. And if they didn't find a dead duck, they'd come back and give you that look, like you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but if you got the duck, they were proud of you. <laughs> Harry S. Birch. Now we look at the transition from water to land as the shanty boats move from their riverine area to the, to the land. Shanty boats were brought up on dry land, placed on pilings, and used as lodgings for gunning uh, parties. At least five gunning lodges on Assateague Island either began as and or were incorporated into shanty boats, incorporated shanty boats into their uh, construction. We called them floating shanties. And then maybe as they got older or more established in some given place that they hunted a lot, they would actually bring them up on the marsh float them up on a high tide, and what we call jack them up, put some piling or something under them, rolling fish pal. Not only were shanty boat gunning clubs moving from water to land, but they were also changing in complexity. And then they would, a lot of times, make them bigger by building a room or kitchen on or something like that, rolling fish pal. In addition to single owner shanty boats, they were also operated as corporations, and in, ca in the case of Green Run uh, Gunning Club, a commercial gunning club. They were also becoming a permanent land-based club uh, with caretaker, guide, and cook. 
So a lot of them were a combination of a floating boat or shanty that had been jacked up along with most of the lumber that they had picked up off the beach, and they built an extra room or on something like that. Rolling fish pal. Now we move on to land. As hunting trips on Aztec became more and more popular, savvy guides sought to create a more permanent base for their guests. Almost simultaneously, wealthy guests themselves sought to cut out the middleman and to create hunting accommodations of their own on Aztec. If a man wants to run away from business and work for a few days to enjoy restful beds, plenty of good food prepared by a chef who knows how to cook, and serve at a quiet spot with all modern conveniences, Green Run Lodge offers just these comforts. Green Run brochure, 1946. Green Run was probably one of the best known gunning clubs up and down the East Coast when they had it. 30 guides there, probably two or three cooks. They had a game room, it was beautiful. Different mounts of heads and a big stone fireplace in there. The original gunning clubs were houseboats. Shanty boats on the water. Roland E. Fish Pal. Green Run Club was about 500 feet long. It had a row of bedrooms on one side in the end. It had, a, it had about a 10-foot fireplace. Silver dollars in the mortar. Picture window on each side of it looking out on the bay. It was a beautiful place. Harry S. Birch. Waterfowl hunting was highly regarded as a social outing, sometimes among businessmen. It has been said as many business deals have been made during a goose hunting trip as has been made on the golf course. Ralph Eshelman. People would fly in from Baltimore and Washington and land on the levels. Almost 100 airplanes on the levels. Little bi-wing planes, little planes coming down to Jackson's for lunch, fishing, or riding on the beach, or whatever, and they gambled. David Cropper. When they first started, they went to the houseboats. But when the club got built, the Pope's Island Duck Club was a money-making proposition. One night, we'd been out duck shooting, and I seen these two fellows on this island with this duck blind. It was Major Allen, the fellow who was head of the J.E. Griner Company, and he had the commissioner of the State Roads of Maryland with him. Well, we didn't know what was going on, but after that, the Chesapeake Bay Bridge started to go up. See, they talk business while they were in that blind watching the ducks come in. So that club, I don't think, owed anybody any money. That's the way they made their living. William Falwell Jester. Mr. Decker, he came in there from Black and Decker. I've seen him come there with five head of them and their wives and all. They'd stay to the house and sometimes I'd see them come in with those old big suitcases. I'd be mad as soon as I looked at them. I had to tote all that mess. Haul it up. They dress up in evening gowns, everything nice for their husbands. It was just an ordinary dinner, but they would dress up for dinner. And of course, that is mighty unusual for those guides to see anything like that, you know, especially when you're accustomed to nothing but men. Captain William T. Savage. And they would have governors down where they sold this granite and all this big stone and stuff, and also governors and architects. They were doing so much business through him. He liked gunning too, so that's about how the business all was running from. Though it was business deals, they didn't talk hundreds or things like that. They were thousands and millions. I sat there and listened to them talk nights. They probably had some clients in there and they were trying to do business with. That's the way the world goes. Captain William T. Savage. What larder can excel that of the Cinepuxin? Luscious oysters and fresh fish to alternate with roast goose and duck. Fresh eggs, rich sausage, and potatoes from the farms. One can live royally at the shanty, and every hour of rest and sleep after eating adds an ounce to a man's avoirdupois and a steel spring to his lifting power. Forest and Stream, November 1876. It was good times, too. Real, real good times. It's just a great relationship, whoever you're hunting with. It's not like going to a football game with somebody, sitting there and yell and hoop and yell and go on. You go and sit in that blind with another guy or two guys. You go there and sit the whole damn day with them. 
I mean, you got to have a nice relationship with him. Otherwise, you're not going to take him back again. <laughs> George A. Purnell. I was sitting there at the table one morning. I looked out in the harbor, and I kept seeing this thing bobbing up and down. What the hell is that? Good Lord, it's one of our guys. Doggone it. He'd gone to the bathroom and fell overboard, and he's out there bobbing up and down in the water. Needless to say, he didn't go gunning that day. We put him back in bed. George A. Purnell. Newspapers also told the story of shanty boat uh, gunning clubs and their events. This poem, penned by a local, represents the feelings uh, about the gunning clubs, the institution of shanty boats uh, that many other people feel. I'll pause just a minute for you to read it. Then we move on to the end of the, an era. In an effort to restore the declining wildfowl population, federal regulations of 1937 prohibited sink boxes, bait, live decoys, and limited repeating guns to three shells. The loss of eelgrass due to blight in the 1920s, the Great Depression, and severe storms along the mid-Atlantic in the 1930s also contributed to the decline of traditional waterfowl hunting and their associated clubs and lodges. I couldn't believe that they had all these, all these houses up, you know, back in the woods there. I mean, I was familiar with Green Run, but High Winds was huge. It was twice the size of the other clubs, with the exception of the commercial club that Green Run had. It was always kept immaculate. George A. Purnell. High Winds was two shanty boats that they pulled up there originally. And then they added on to them. They put a room off to the side and a room in the back of them. And then they made another room in front where the entrance was. And off to the side they had, well, we had a large octagonal shaped room, living room with a big fireplace. Dr. Francis J. Townsend, Jr. Government interest in creating a national seashore on Assateague Island signaled the death knell for, for seaside hunting clubs. Rather than await the inevitable seizure of their property, corporate owners took steps to sell off their holdings. The Bobadell Club was sold for $5,000, while its founder had poured nearly $80,000 into its original construction. The new owners promptly revived the shareholder system and sold access rights for $500 plus a yearly maintenance fee. After a protracted court battle, the government gave the remaining hunting clubs on Aztec a choice. Sell your holdings now for X amount of money or lease the property for 25 years. Tellingly, every last club chose the lease rather than the cash payment. And that leads us to they're gone. The shanties, they're gone. It bothered me to watch them disappear because I used to love to go to them because I thought it was more like being down the bay than the houses up on the land. It's like an era that has gone, not here anymore, you know, George A. Purnell. 
I was looking at a couple of pictures, thinking about it. Those old guys standing around, they're all gone, though. Every one of them is gone. George A. Purnell. This exhibit closes with a brief look at the condition of shanty boats uh, and gunning clubs today. We'll compare, we'll show you the way they looked and now the way that they look now. Now I'll turn the presentation over to Stephanie Gordy. I just wanted to thank you all for coming here this evening because you all are the reason why this presentation is taking place. Um, when I first, I, I work for Salisbury University and one of my goals was to, to connect Worcester County with the university. And I met with this gentleman over here, Reese Crowper, III, and um, we talked about different ways of doing that. And he had talked about his love for this campus here at Worcester Prep, and we thought it would be a great location to have something like this. And then I went and I talked to Mitch Parker, and he said, you know, what interesting he's doing something with the gunning clubs he had seen something at one point that, that uh, Dr. Thompson had done years ago which was we've expanded on it and then I went and I met with Mr. Jenkins and I said you know we have this idea of doing this presentation on gunning, clamps, gunning clubs and shanty boats do you know anything about that and he said well you know I used to own Father Dell and I had no idea of being having no history with this kind of gunning clubs and, and shanty, shanty boots, but 
So this is an evening for you all to talk about and share some experiences and memories that you have. I know the Savages have quite a few, um, and many of you, many of the other ones of you do as well. Um, I wanted to let you know that, and I hope you get a taste for it, the fact that Salisbury University, the history of this area, Delmarva and its culture is very important to the university. Um, and actually, the university has recently created an initiative between the Ward Museum, which is part of the university, and the NAB Research Center, which is also part of the university, um, to create and preserve to preserve the history of this area. Um, Laura Botanelli is here, as is Dr. Thompson. We'll be here to, to talk to you about um, some of the things we're doing. We have a lot of great events. That's why I wanted to make sure that we got your email and contact information so we can let you know. And we are committed to preserving this. Um, so hopefully this will be one of many things that you will engage in and now at this time, I want to open it up all to you all. So, Mr. Jenkins, did you want to say anything? Or would anyone like to share an experience? Many of you, I thought he'd win and drank a few more. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I can remember my father and, and Josh Quillen would have stories of going down the bay and they would talk about having their hunting club and what they would do during the winter. And, and, they had a command car right after World War II. If you all know what a command car is, a track car. And and he would tell me a story about they would leave on Sunday night from the very north end of Assateague after they had taken a rowboat across the inlet and a five horsepower outboard with their supplies for the week. And they'd take the command car down the beach, whether it was Green Run or somewhere else. And they would spend the entire week down the bay. And they would hunt all week long and they would entertain different uh, guests who were either paid guests or members of the, of the club they were guiding for. And then they would hunt all the way till Saturday night. And then Saturday night they would take the command car back up to the north end of Assateague and go across the inlet in this same rowboat. And, uh, and, and they did this for two months at a time. And what great stories came out of all of that uh, that I, I grew up with. And, and I was very fortunate. My father actually worked at Bobadell when I was a kid. I worked for Mr. Jenkins, and, and so uh, when I was when I was little, and I could <clears throat> and I um, maybe escape from school for a day or two, or uh, school wasn't even here then, so <laughs> and uh, get a chance to go over and spend a few days over there. It was always a great good and uh, great great memories. And I and I'm glad that you guys came, and I hope y'all will share some of the stories that you have, uh, whether it's yourself or your family that went down the bay. Uh, some of us that are here today are still very fortunate that uh, I, I got to be a member of Bobadell as I got older, which was a great treat to go there as, uh, I guess, as, as a, my father was an employee there, and to go back as a member later on was one of the highlights of, of my life, and I enjoyed it. And we still have a, a, a very wonderful place down the bay called Asperger Island, which I think still lives in that tradition of those Assateague gun clubs, and I see a couple of my friends and members here. so. Hope you all enjoy the evening, and thanks again. What I did bring, though, anybody that's my age or older, you pe younger people won't know what this is, but you older guys will. And uh, anybody that's ever hunted down the bay in the, in the early 60s and before would know that all those boats are wooden, and they all leaked. The scows leaked, the barges leaked, the hunting chance, they all, they all they claim they did. So we used to use these to pump them out, and I brought this, and I remember the, the old days we used to use the old galvanized uh, bilge pumps. I think Grover can show you how they work. It. You think so? <laughs> did, his, did his not work fast enough on that? I mean, he got tricked by it. Well, they was always one in the blind, that's for sure. And they were also in the boat, so again, thank you.